Well, hello, everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us. Welcome to Open Hardware TV, uh, season one, episode two, where we'll talk about the uh, core five family of open source source five cores. And as we did with episode one, uh, portions of uh, today's uh, webinar have been pre-recorded and we'll live stream that content in a moment. All of the speakers are with us now to, uh, uh, and we'll be listening uh, through the live stream together with the, the viewing audience. And we'll be back, there's roughly around 30 some odd minutes of pre-recorded content. We'll be back together live at the bottom of the hour to take any questions that come in over the chat window. So please, if you have questions along the way, uh, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A box in the, in, the, uh, in the Zoom webinar tool. And then we'll uh, come back live at the end of the uh, live stream. Uh, to answer those questions. So thanks for joining us and here comes uh, episode two. Well, hello everyone, welcome to Open Hardware TV episode two. My name is Rick O'Connor and I'll be the host for today's episode. Open Hardware TV is a series of live stream webcasts for the Open Hardware Group ecosystem where we detail the various projects that we have underway uh, within the community and hopefully provide some information for users and adopters of the open source IP that we're curating. If you missed episode one, we focused on the verification test bench environment that we're using uh, for our open source cores, the core five family of open source risc five cores. And that test bench is built around system Verilog and UVM constructs to provide the best in class uh, industry quality verification environment that uh, we can for for these open source cores. You can go over to our site at openhardwaregroup.org, openhwgroup.org, and uh, look for the Open Hardware TV drop down menu if you wanted to uh, watch the replay of, of that webcast. In that episode, we provided a, a little bit longer overview of the Open Hardware Group uh, overall. And if, if you're not familiar with what we're up to, you might want to check out that introduction as well as the uh, full verification task group overview. In today's episode, we're gonna focus on the cores that we're working on, our core five family of cores, um, of open source uh, risc five based cores. So with that, let's jump into the introduction uh, for today and uh, take a look at the overview of the uh, of today's session. I'm gonna provide a few minutes of uh, introduction to the Open Hardware Group. And then we'll bring in our leadership team for the Open Hardware Group Cores Task Group. That's made up of Arjun Bink from Silicon Labs, Jérôme Guerlain from TALUS, and our own Davide Schiavone, who's our Director of Engineering for the Cores Task Group. And you might also know uh, Davide from his long tenure um, at ETH Zurich, uh, where he's a candidate for a PhD uh, later this year. Following that uh, panel, we'll bring in individual presentations from, again, we'll bring Davide back as he's the one of the principal architects behind the RISC-E core, now within the Open Hardware Group as the CV32E4. And then we'll bring uh, Florian Zaruba, who is also part of our Open Hardware Group engineering staff as our director of engineering for the hardware and software task group. And he'll give us an overview of Ariane, which is uh, now called the A6, the CVA6 within the open hardware group. And then we'll follow that with an innovation on top of the area on design from uh, Jean-Jacques Coulon and his team at Talos, where they have um, developed a parameterized option to create either a 32-bit or 64-bit core from the same code, the area and code base. Before we get into those, we'll just do a quick overview of the open hardware group. So we're a nonprofit organization driven by our ecosystem made up of members uh, from the hardware and software community where they collaborate on open source IP artifacts uh, related to cores and tools uh, and, and, and uh, infrastructure for, for open source IP. In particular, the initial projects are focused around the core five family of cores, uh, which we'll detail today. Uh, so we've got a very strong international footprint um, with developers in North America, Europe, and Asia. And the focus of the organization is really to provide that infrastructure where we can host high quality open source IP development 
um, and verification of that IP for use in high volume production SOCs. So we have a belief in leveraging commercial tool flows because that's what production companies go to high volume production with um, and make sure that the IP fits well into those flows. We have very, very strong support across the industry, academia, and individual contributors with uh, over 50 plus members and partners worldwide. Here's an overview of the uh, industry ecosystem, a very healthy uh, representation of very large companies, some smaller companies in the semiconductor space, in the tool space, in the, in the systems uh, side of the business, quite a, quite a healthy cross section uh, across the industry that we think really provides a, a healthy interaction within our task groups to make sure that we're curating uh, open source IP that can be used by everyone. On the research side, we've got a healthy uh, participation from a number of high quality research institutes. Uh, there are more coming and uh, we expect to have uh, quite an active community in this space as well. And on the partner side, we're very fortunate to have some high quality industry partners uh, that engage, engage with us to help us deliver the IP, the open source IP that we're working on within the ecosystem. So with that, what is it that we're really trying to solve? What is the uh, challenge here? I mean, clearly, the open source software community has been vibrant for many years. There's a, there's a proven business model around open source software, and that's not quite the case yet for open source hardware. And we see three barriers to entry, or see barriers to adoption for, uh, for open source hardware, and that's IP quality, the ecosystem itself, and the licensing models, and how, how permissive uh, the IP is. So from a, an IP quality standpoint, we dealt sort of with that topic in episode one, the verification test bench uh, that, we're, that we are working on and, and delivering. In today's episode, we're gonna focus specifically on the cores, the roadmap for the cores, um, and, and uh, how we curate that. So with that, I'll throw it back over and we'll welcome in to the, to the episode, Arjun Dink from Silicon Labs, uh, Jérôme Guérima from Talos, and David Giovanni from the engineering staff here at the Open Harbor Group. Welcome to the episode, gentlemen. Welcome, thanks. Thank you, Rick. All right. Hi. Arjun, uh, as, our, as our chair of the course task group, uh, can you walk us through the, the charter and focus for the group, please? Uh, yes, sure, Rick. Uh, let me talk you through the most important points of the course task group uh, charter. Um, we provide support to the technical working group in the definition of the course IP roadmap. Um, we obtain, develop and maintain uh, new core IPs based on this roadmap. Uh, it's important to say here that core IPs not necessarily mean CPUs, although today uh, all the IP we are working on happen to be CPUs. Uh, of course, we actually do the, the, the work in this task group, so it means that we will plan and coordinate the development efforts for these core IPs. Uh, and in the end, of course, the goal is to deliver open source uh, production quality IP cores. So that means that we work tightly together with the verification task group and with the software task group. If we then actually look at the cores that we are developing, uh, these are four cores at the moment that are on our roadmap. Uh, the first two are the CV32E40P and the closely related CV32E40. Uh, today we are working on this 40P core. Uh, Basically, this is the risky core, as we inherited from the bulk team. Uh, it's a 32-bit uh, RISC-V architecture, including the multiply uh, optional floating point and compressed instruction set architecture. It also has the x extension as developed by the bulk team. It's machine mode only. It has the Clint interrupt architecture and it has a regular four-stage pipeline. Uh, after this, it's the intention to start working on the E40 core. It's very similar to the 40P core, except that certain pulp extensions will be replaced by standard RISC-V extensions, assuming that they have been ratified by them. Uh, specifically, we intend to include the bit manipulation and the PECT SIMD extensions. 
Uh, also, this core will uh, support user mode and the PMP. And then I would like to ask Jerome to introduce the A6 cores, please. Thank you, Ayan. Uh, the CV uh, A6 cores uh, are uh, derived from the donation of uh, Ariane uh, by the PULP team at ETH Zurich. Uh, it's, uh, they, they are application, uh, application cores uh, because you can boot uh, rich OACs like uh, Linux. Uh, there will be two flavors of this course. The CV64S6 uh, core, uh, which is basically Ariane, and is it's a 64-bit uh, core with six level of pipelines, uh, L1 caches, uh, and an MMU, and many features. And uh, the other flavor is uh, CV32S6, uh, a more compact 32-bit uh, uh, version uh, of Ariane uh, when you don't need to address uh, so much uh, so much memory. Uh, the donation of the source code were very recent, and uh, we are starting uh, the work uh, towards uh, defining uh, the detailed features and uh, starting verifications. Great. Thanks. Uh, Davide, why don't you walk us through the, the, the workflow that we have on GitHub for how people participate? Yes, so as our APs are open source, the beauty of, uh, of being open source means that everyone is allowed to actually open issues and submit pull requests on our GitHub repositories. That means that uh, everyone can participate to our activities either if it is just documentation or if it is verification or in the, in the RTL of one of our cores, they can just, I mean, everyone can just ask questions or actually propose a new feature that then the open hardware um, team on the core will discuss and decide which priority that new feature will have and if it is aligned with our roadmap. Everyone can also submit pull requests if they find bugs or they, if they want to implement by themselves a feature and then donate it to us on our APs. We will be very glad to review them and merge it in our mainline repositories. Thanks, Rick. All right. Um, so what we're going to hear shortly uh, from the architects of the original cores, obviously that include uh, Davide for the risk, history of the RISPI core. Uh, Florian on the Ariane core and Jarak uh, Kunal from Talos on, on the contribution of the parameterized 32-bit version of Ariane. So we'll hear from those guys in a minute. But uh, before we get to that, uh, Jacome and, and Ariane, a question for you guys and in, in your role in, in your companies at, at Talos and Silicon Labs. Uh, can you share what the priorities are for participating in the open hardware group and in particular your leadership roles in the course task group? Uh, Ariane, why don't you go first? Okay, sure. Yeah, for us, the top priority is really to, to get uh, a verified RISC-V core, uh, confirming to industry quality uh, design and verification rules. Um, so for us, really the focus is on verification. Uh, then, of course, in the in the uh, course task group, um, we contribute uh, to make sure that we uh, get the features that we want at, uh, let's say, at the power performance and area cost uh, that are interesting to our products. So it's basically those two things, getting the features we are looking for and getting the verification according to the best uh, possible or industry standard verification. Great, thanks. Uh, Jérôme, what's, what's your take on that question? Uh, at TELES, we have surveyed uh, the need of our users, and it turned out that uh, Ariane uh, was our priority. Uh, we want to have a verified uh, vendor independent, independent core. Uh, we like uh, both flavors, 32-bit uh, and 64-bit of uh, CVA6, and we want to target uh, both. ASIC optimized and FPGA optimized versions. Uh, and as a vice chair of the core stats group, uh, I will be more dedicated to uh, leading uh, the Ariane related uh, tasks uh, with uh, 
open hardware participants and maybe new participants interested in CVI6. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, please hang around. We'll have a Q&A session at the end with uh, questions submitted by our viewers. So now we'll switch over to more of a, a deep dive into the core five family of open source risk five cores that we're curating within the open hardware group. And uh, first up, we'll bring back Davide Schiavone, who is part of our engineering staff here at the Open Hardware Group. And many of you know him from his significant contributions to the Paul Platform team under the leadership of uh, Professor Luca Benini. Uh, Davide was the, one of the uh, main ar architects behind the Risky Core. And uh, he'll provide an overview of the Risky Core and its migration into the Open Hardware Group under the CD. E4 uh, banner. So welcome, welcome back, Davide. Thanks, Rick, and everyone for joining us. Here is Davide, Director of Engineering of the Open Hardware Group and PhD student at ATH. So let me introduce you to the history of RISCI or, and the PALP project. So PALP was born in 2013, and it's a microcontroller that aims to achieve high performance at low power uh, consumption. If we see the market, we see that microcontrollers are usually either high performance, consuming in the order of watt, or low power in the order of milliwatts, but low performance. The goal of PALP is joining both the, uh, the features of this, these two uh, spectrum of microcontrollers to, to have an energy efficient, open source, programmable, performant microcontroller. And uh, the application target of PALP is edge computing devices of the Internet of Things. How to achieve that? So the idea of PALP is creating a multi-core to achieve high performance, running at near threshold to achieve low power. And uh, as, as you can see here in the architecture, you see that there are many IPs, and the main ones we can say are the microprocessors, the cores that are running the, the applications. And we decided to base the PALP microcontroller on the RISC-5 ISA. As the RISC-5 ISA is open source and, and uh, quite, a, quite a new ISA, well-maintained, easy, well-described and documented. And so we started by developing our microprocessors, starting from the RISC-E core, which is the most famous one. The RISC core is based on RISC-5. It implements integer multiplications, compressed and floating point instruction set extensions. As four pipeline stages, it's in order. Furthermore, it has been extended with custom extensions to achieve higher performance and energy efficiency in the typical IoT applications as, a bit as, um, as the ones running on the edge computing devices. So, we extend the core with bit manipulations, hardware loops, SIMD operations. The nice things about PALP, as I uh, said at the beginning, is its open source nature. And as PALP, all the IPs like RISC are open source with a very permissive license and available on GitLab. GitHub, sorry. And uh, its open source nature actually attracted very, very, uh, many other users that were uh, using the IP to uh, teaching, uh, prototypes, or even to uh, making products based on, uh, on our IPs. But the problem is that when you want to build products based on open source IPs maintained by the university, you're usually lacking documentation, verification, uh, compliance fixes, and so forth, simply because the goal of universities producing research and not products. And for this reason, we decided to graduate RISCI from the university to Open Hardware Group uh, under the name of CV32E4, E4TP. Uh, the goal of Open Hardware Group is keep on maintaining this core open source and with the same permissive license, but this time with an industry level support where bug fixes are done, compliance checks, documentation has been rewritten and verification as you heard in the previous episodes of the open hardware group tv and it's still on github so for this reason everyone can open issues ask questions 
making pull requests for bug fixes, and the open hardware team will review them. The open hardware team will also meet to define its roadmap, to discuss what are the features that need to be implemented, and so forth, with the final goal of having a high quality silicon proven open source RISC V core. So, what have open hardware been doing lately? We made many status, up, status updates. We developed a, a new open bus interface, a memory interface, which now supports outstanding transactions. Um, it decouples requests and valid signals to reach higher frequency and adds address stability, very important for formal verification. We implemented the RISC V performance counters compliant with the spec, replacing the old ones. We made updates in the simulation tracer so that uh, we can use the Imperas instruction set simulator for doing um, tandem verification. We made the hardware loop a parameter in the, at the top level of the core so that the user can use or not the hardware loops, uh, saving area and bad to losing performance. Plus, we are actually working on the clean support, which is an activity in progress with the Waltas group. We are defining the spec of that, compliant with RIS-5. We've done many bug fixes because there were open issues on GitHub regarding illegal instructions or debug, wrong debug behaviors. And we completely redone from scratch the documentation, which is now text-based in Spings. Uh, we update the content and we made it uh, look very good and professional. Uh, and we also solve bugs on the documentation, by the way. Plus, still as a work in progress, we are working on the manifest, uh, manifest file with few SOC support. We are working on the synthesis scripts and, um, and many other activities. If you are curious about the previous Core 5 tape outs, you can have a look at the AZ gallery of ATH. You will be find the first version of the CV32E4TP core, Risky, Onibani, in 28 nanometer, with the, up to the last one, the most advanced in 22 nanometers with Arnold, or in 65 nanometer with Xavier, Urania. And uh, if you want to have a look at the professional products, you can use the GAP8 board from Green Waves, which has many risky cores on board, or the um, NXP Vega board, which is um, uh, an evaluation board with our um, IP. Thanks a lot for your attention. OK, very good. Thanks, Davide. Uh, please hang around for the Q&A session at the end. Thank you. Now we'll move over to uh, the history of the Ariane core. And we're lucky enough to have Florian Zaruba, also part of the Open Hardware Group engineering staff, while he completes his PhD work uh, under Professor Luca Benini at ETH Zurich. And Florian was the principal architect behind the Ariane core. So welcome to the episode, Florian. Thanks, Rick, uh, for the introduction. Um, are we going to talk about uh, CVA6, uh, or formerly known as Ariane, the 64-bit application class core? So as David briefly mentioned, is that the, the core also originated from the PULP project, which is a research project from ETH Zurich and University of Bologna. And the main goal of it was to develop uh, energy-efficient uh, hardware and processor IPs. Uh, we started off with mostly embedded devices for the Internet of Things. Uh, but then we had this research question is whether we can transfer the lessons uh, which we learned from the IoT domain also to the data center and high performance computing domain. And what we needed for that was a general purpose application class core, uh, which we could integrate in our SOCs. So what is an application class core? So there is no formal definition of an application class core, but as a minimum, uh, I would say it should run an operating system and it should be uh, user programmable so that the user can launch different tasks and the operating system takes care of the underlying hardware and scheduling um, the tasks. Um, what this means in RISC-V terms is that uh, the processor should implement parts or most of the privileged uh, specification, which is the second volume of the ISA specification. What this does or specifies is mostly um, control and status registers and additional processor state, um, which is implicit. 
furthermore, it also specifies virtual memory um, or um, address translation from virtual addresses to machine uh, or physical addresses. And what's also needed uh, for the operating system to keep uh, the time uh, for timekeeping and scheduling of tasks is a timer interrupt. Um, what we wanted to do, and we set out to develop this core to boot a Unix class operating system, in particular Linux. So I introduce CVA6, um, or formerly known as Ariane, which is a 64-bit IMAFD um, C core. Um, so it has support for the integer, multiply and division, atomics, single precision and double precision floating point instructions, as well as the compressed instruction. It is a six-stage core to run at a reasonable speed and to uh, speed up the sequential code commonly found in operating systems. It's a single in-order issue core, and it has support for three privileged levels, machine mode, supervisor mode, and user mode. In order to uh, reduce the impact of, uh, of branches, uh, it also features three different branch predictors, a return address stack to predict on the return addresses, the branch target buffer uh, to predict on unknown uh, branch targets, and the branch history table to predict on taken or non-taken branches. Uh, Ariane also has support for SV, SV39 virtual memory. It has support for the uh, debug, external debug specification, uh, 0.13, and uh, we offer optional uh, non-standard small float extensions, which offer 8-bit, 16, and 32-bit uh, SIMD floating point operations. The focus uh, while designing Ariane was on, uh, particularly on an ASIC design, and it is written in System Verilog. Unfortunately, the core itself is not enough to boot uh, an operating system. You also need a reasonable fast emulation platform, which in that case uh, is an FPGA prototype and a small system on chip component around the core, uh, which provides support for memory, external debug support, uh, the platform level interrupt controller called PLIC, or the, and the core local interrupt controller called CLINT. What we offer is an FPGA emulation or an FPGA prototype uh, based on the Genesis 2 platform from Digiland, which runs the Ariane core at 50 megahertz. There, are, uh, there also have been exciting, uh, let's call it inofficial user contributions for other FPGA platforms, such as the KC705 and the VC707. As I said, our focus has always been on ASIC design. And so we have already manufactured uh, Ariane or uh, CVA6 in uh, different technology flavors. Um, one, uh, most of them actually in 22 uh, nanometers global foundries, a relatively state of the art technology. So um, the ASICs can actually run from 800 to megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz, depending on the uh, features and the speed targets we wanted to implement. But the core was designed to run at a approximately one gigahertz uh, in, in a reasonable new technology such as 22 nanometers. The core has been open sourced in 2017 under the SolderPad hardware license. The core development in the beginning was quite in flux, uh, but has mostly stabilized in the, in the last year. There have been two uh, Google Summer of Code projects, and one of which is ongoing. Uh, in total, over 1,800 1, uh, commits from over 30 uh, contributors and a total of 450 pull requests and issued, answered, and merged. So you could ask what's next, and the exciting story uh, begins. Uh, unfortunately, this ETH, uh, we have limited resources to support all users, uh, which we want to support, uh, and we can't provide the industry-level verification and uh, support uh, as we would like to do. So the core was transferred donated, or as David wants, uh, wanted to call it, graduated university now, and moved into the open hardware group under CVA6. We want to develop a unified core development and verification strategy for all the cores in the family. One already two exciting contributions ongoing is the support for application space identifier called ASITS, which is contributed by Hansel Cyber, which is under review currently. And another one, uh, the 32-bit version, which is a parameterized version of uh, CVA6, which is contributed by Thales, which is also under review. Chirac will tell you more uh, in the upcoming section. 
So further development is uh, still based on GitHub, but now in the open hardware uh, namespace uh, under CVA6. Questions, problem, and feature requests, uh, just uh, shoot them at the issue tracker. Uh, if you want to get involved, open a pull request, open an issue on GitHub. And uh, we are currently working on uh, solidifying documentation and verification and uh, to apply the lessons learned for the small core, also for the, uh, the larger core. Um, so don't hesitate to ask any questions, and I'm happy to also answer um, your questions in the, in the upcoming discussion. Very good. Thanks very much, Florian. And uh, uh, please hang around for the Q&A session, uh, which will be at the end, towards the end of the episode. So our last scheduled talk is from Jean-Arc Coulon from the team at Talos. And Jean-Arc's team has been working on a, uh, a, an interesting innovation on the Ariane core where they have parameterized the ability to produce a 32-bit or 64-bit core from the same code base. Um, and, we'll, and there's a pull request now that is being reviewed within the open hardware group, uh, course task group, uh, with, with that contribution. So Jean-Hoc, welcome uh, to the episode. Okay. Thank you, Rick, to be here today. One year ago, we were dreaming of a processor with the following features. To be a RISC-V, because it became the standard, to target from uh, embedded to uh, application fields, uh, to be small in a silicon uh, footprint, to be compact in code size, uh, performant, to get MMU and caches to, to be able to run Linux, uh, to get a floating point unit and DSP. One critical point is to be mat mature for uh, industry and also the dependency versus license and uh, design flow tools is uh, very important. That's why we have benched uh, the current uh, implementation of RISC-V, uh, we know, uh, Rocket from Berkeley, the Western Digital Cores, Synopsis Cores also, um, RISC-E, which is, uh, which is uh, very familiar for Open Hardware Group, IBEX, and also Ariane. Rocket was a very good candidate. Is Rocket fulfilled the, all the requirements? Risk of five specification is widely implemented in Rocket. Uh, it suits to embedded to application field, thanks to the two flavor, the 32 and the 64 uh, flavor. The performance is good and the community is very active. The development community, I mean. Except that Rocket uses Chisel translator tool, which depends on Berkeley. It is dangerous to rely on Rocket for, for those aspects. And what about uh, Ariane? Ariane is a very sexy uh, processor because performance is good. Uh, there is no chisel, but uh, classical uh, system very low. So it is a good core, except that we have to work a little bit on silicon footprint. Actually, currently we are at 400 equivalent, equivalent kilogates because um, we cannot disable the features we do not use, for instance, uh, floating point unit or caches. Uh, the maturity of Ariane is quite um, low. Uh, for instance, if, you, if we pass all the regression suite of Ariane, we get only 60% of code coverage. And uh, um, we get a few industrial users and a few contributors. But we have a plan. We propose to, to do the promotion uh, of Ariane, which is called the CVA6 in Open Hardware Group, because it is a very smart uh, solution. Last week, we have uh, done a, a pull request to introduce the 32-bit flavor in, uh, in Ariane. Our goal is to reduce the silicon uh, uh, footprint, uh, 60 equivalent kilogates are expected, 
our goal is to run Linux, to reuse also the verification which is done with uh, RISCI, and to increase the number of users and, uh, and the contributors. To improve the goal, the final objective is if to improve the maturity level of this uh, processor. If you are looking at the code, the RTL code of Ariane, by switching the parameter, which is called xlen 32 bit, you you pass from you you switch from the 30, 64 bit to the 32 bit uh, version of Ariane. All the rem remaining code is uh, equal. There is only one RTL for two processors. Looking at the block diagram of Ariane. In red, the red blocks are the blocks which has been modified to introduce a 32-bit uh, flavor. As you can see, only the blocks belonging to, to the core are modified, and, uh, and uh, the interface to the external world is not impacted. For instance, AXE bus interface, cache, cache uh, external memories or debug are still in 64 bits. If you are interested in uh, using CVA6, 32 bit or, six, or uh, 64 bits, please contact us. We have, uh, we can together specify the, uh, and fine tune the CVA6 uh, implementation. And there are also uh, a lot of uh, collaborative uh, work development to, to do. Uh, for instance, to, to move the FPU uh, from 64 to, to 32 bits, or maybe to adapt the test bench uh, by introducing the step and compare uh, functionality, and to improve uh, verification. As conclusion, I would like to give a warm thank you to uh, Florian Zaruba, uh, which is the father of uh, uh, Argan, because uh, his baby is very smart. And also, thank you for all the coming contributors, which uh, will, who will be pleased to contribute to, to Ariane. Please contact us, uh, we can discuss about it. That's great, John. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution and uh, stay with us. We'll bring all of the speakers back in a panel and we'll open up the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in on the on the Q and A uh, chat box that, that we'll go through. Some of which we answered live, uh, just uh, with a reply during the live stream. Uh, so, to all the panelists and, and speakers, uh, please unmute, unmute your microphones. Obviously, just before you answer any of the questions, there's a few that haven't been answered yet, and, and we had a number of questions that were sent to us uh, during the, the registration for the webinar. So I'll read out some of the questions and then we can have a discussion. And you can also raise your hand as an attendee if you wanna ask your question live or uh, you know, feel free to just type more questions in the, in the Q&A box and that'd be fine. Uh, one of the first questions that uh, came in uh, during registration as well as uh, uh, over the chat box was around you know, verification and the quality of the cores and so on. We, we, we dealt with the verification test bench in our first uh, in our, in our first uh, episode uh, last month. Um, so if you haven't seen that, go, go and have a look at it. Uh, but uh, um, there's a few questions that are themed together around uh, the core quality and are there, are there cores in production? How can there be cores in production if we're talking about still verifying the cores and, and you know, that general topic? So uh, I'll rephrase the question into, um, are there are there core use of the core five family risky and Arian in production devices today? That's question one. And then the other question uh, that, that sort of builds on that: How can that be the case if we're doing all of this verification work? Uh, so, um, who wants to go first in in answering one of those uh, questions? The first question: Are there production uses of these cores today? Davide, do you want to take a shot? And then some of the other guys, you can chime in if you want. 
So, um, as you said, the, the core in the Pulp platform, so I everyone. So, uh, the core has been uh, taped out many times under the, um, at ATH together with the University of Bologna in many chips, and but they were just prototypes. However, um, Greenwaves technology made some um, some chips. Uh, Gap eight is uh, one of those that has many many of these cores, and they internally verified. Uh, so the fact that we are doing verification is just to to bring it first of all available with the wall um, infra uh, infrastructure and tandem verification against uh, a reference model. And, uh, uh, but this doesn't mean that the code is under verification because it has never been verified before. Right, and uh, what about the, the Ariane core? We know that that's been released in production uh, a, a few times already, even most recently by the Hensel team. So maybe one of the Talos guys, you want to talk about that, Jaron? Uh, uh, yes, the, the, um, uh, we don't know so much about the status of verification at uh, Ensol Cyber uh, MiG-5, so I won't comment on that. Uh, uh, however, what we would like to have is uh, to improve uh, the verification to address every corner uh, of the verification and uh, also uh, to uh, make available uh, verification environments. So uh, not only uh, will open hardware deliver cores, but also verification environments that uh, users uh, can uh, replay again and uh, where they can bring more trust uh, in their ICs. Right, and I'll add, maybe I'll add to that a little bit. You know, what, what we're trying to provide, um, when I say we, I'm talking about the open hardware community. Yeah, so as, as a collective, what we're trying to provide is effectively what you would get from a commercial IP vendor, but obviously open source and royalty free, but the quality of a core, a general purpose core, without the knowledge of what your end application is. And so the verification requirement in that is, is different than a purpose-built piece of hardware that's going into a purpose-built device with a specific application in mind that you can constrain uh, the way the, the IP will be used, right? So this is general purpose IP cores that can be used across any application, and that's the verification strategy. So have a look at the verification test bench episode from last month. You'll see what that looks like and what we're working on. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool environment. So we'll, we'll switch, uh, switch gears a little bit to another question. Um, and one of them is related to, hey, you know, can, we, can I test this thing out or use this in an, in an FPGA, FPGA environment? Or are there any new tape outs planned or SOCs planned? So let's start with the FPGA work and, and the, the work that we're doing uh, there um, uh, to, to bring up the, both the, the, the E4 and, and the A6. Florian, you want to take a shot at either one of those? You're muted, I believe, sir. Yes, sure. Um, so yeah, um, so both cores um, actually um, have been developed um, with an SOC in mind. Um, and, and there is already an existing SOC, which you can map to an FPGA. Um, so there is, there is one for the Ariane um, core, which is part of the Ariane repository. And then we are, um, as open hardware, started working on a Pulpissimo fork where we, um, which we use as a test vehicle for um, the, uh, the smaller 32-bit core. And um, yeah, uh, so the question is yes, um, you, you can, as of now, go and, and map the cores uh, in some SSCs to FPJ. Uh, and the idea is that we continue working on, on a streamlined SOC where we, um, where we eventually hopefully uh, have a unique uh, SOC between, shared between all cores, which can be used um, um, by the open hardware users and which can work as a demonstrator or as a starting point um, for further adaption. All right, thank you. So another, another question is around the environment or uh, indirectly around the environment and um, the language that we use, you know, system Verilog, UVM. There was a question about Chipyard, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know what Chipyard is, it's a pretty interesting tool. It's built around Chisel. Uh, Jacques talked a little bit about 
uh, chisel and whether that's attractive or not. So uh, let's spend some time and hear from uh, the Talos guys and from Ariane at, at Silicon Labs around the importance of being able to fit into a system Verilog flow. Um, and, and yet still we do have some work and status of Ariane being used in, uh, in the chipyard environment. Um, one of the things that we have as a, and there's also a question related to the, to the instruction set simulator that we're using uh, from, from the Paris being a commercial tool. Um, before I get, let the panelists talk, one of the mandates that we have on the new open hardware group is to make the IP that we're curating, the open source IP cores that we're curating, fit easily into production tool flows that existing high volume SOC chip companies use today. Uh, there's lots of really cool innovation going on in the CAD space, and that's neat, uh, chisel and other things uh, like that. But the reality of it is most high volume production companies today in the SOC space go to production with a system Verilog based tool flow. So our, our focus is on bringing open source cores uh, to, to the ecosystem that can leverage that commercial tool flow and not try to convince or force an adopter to have to reinvent their tool flow uh, in, in, into something else that they have not used before. That might change later, uh, but the, the near term focus by all means is uh, high volume production SOCs and leveraging ex existing commercial tool flows. And for the same reason, the, the most used and deployed reference model is from the team at, at Imparis, uh, their, their, uh, their ISS. Um, so as we march towards you know, the goal of the highest quality cores possible, we want to be leveraging, taking advantage of every piece of uh, you know, toolkit, if you will, that we can to leverage uh, a best in class uh, set of IP. So uh, Arjan, maybe you can talk about uh, how or, and why System Verilog is important to you, and in particular the 32-bit core and then eventually 64-bit Ariane cores and the importance of System Verilog UVM-based flows. Yes. <laughs> well, basically, it's exactly what you said, right? We, uh, <laughs> Sorry. As, uh, as System Verilog is very important for us, but simply because we want to be able to use the uh, standard commercial EDA tools uh, that we already have a license for, right? So we want to uh, be able to use those tools and we will need to use those anyway because our products are not, not only this core, right? There's a ton of other uh, blocks on the chip and uh, uh, this should just all work together with the same uh, tool flow, right? So the usage of system Verilog is very important for us. Uh, in principle, we do not really care on whether it's, let's say, Verilog or system Verilog or VHDL, right? That that all works very well together, but uh, it needs to be supported by multiple commercial vendors. That's, that's very important. And then on the verification side, well, UVM is basically the standard there. So having a, a good UVM framework for verification uh, is what we would use otherwise as well. So for us, um, right, in, internally the usage of this core would be more difficult if we would require our customers to use different tools or different methodologies, right? It would just be another barrier to using this product. It's, uh, and by by, by, your by your customers, you mean internal Silicon Labs customers who will use the IP? Internal customers. Yeah. And I'm not claiming that one thing is better than the other. It's just one thing people are used to. Uh, and they, they would like to keep using that. It's as simple as that. I mean, um, and, and Jérôme and Jacques, I'll get you guys to comment on that in a second. Um, but part of Part of the challenge that we have as a, as a hardware industry uh, is there's, there are many uh, obstacles, if you will, in the way uh, preventing the adoption of open source IP. Um, and you know, the, the approach that we've taken here at the Open Hardware Group in this community and this ecosystem is let's not try to solve all of those obstacles all at once. 
uh, you know, let's, let's take, a, take a very focused approach, leveraging commercial flows built around system Verilog and UVM methodologies so that we can make the adoption of the cores, uh, if you will, as, as painless as possible. Um, and so, you know, talk, maybe Jérôme and uh, Jean-Arc, you guys can talk about, you know, that environment inside Talos and even, even the, the discussions around embracing open source hardware development, uh, what, what that looks like, system Verilog, UVM, Chisel or not, and, and, and so on. And then Florian, I'll get you to talk in a moment about your experience with Shipyard and, and the Ariane integration. But Jérôme, Jean-Arc, why don't you go, go ahead with your comments. Maybe I can start. Uh, uh, we are looking at Trizal, for instance, uh, but for uh, research topics, uh, more advanced uh, topics. Uh, however, for the uh, regular uh, SOC uh, designers, it's very important uh, to have something uh, they can uh, use uh, in their standard flow, as Arjan. Uh, mentioned and there is also one point which is important for our user is to be able to perform uh, equivalence checking uh, with uh, the code they can read and the code they can simulate and if uh, with uh, high level synthesis and uh, some intermediate uh, if you have some intermediate uh, translations you might might break uh, the equivalence uh, checking chain so that's one of the reasons uh, why it's important to have a standard HDL such as system very log, very log or VHDL. Yes, maybe I can add that uh, with uh, Ariane, we have uh, access to, to the designers, architects that have uh, designed uh, Ariane. We can maybe uh, change or modify uh, uh, the, the specification, maybe if we would like to, to add a coprocessor or something, we can uh, contribute and discuss of it uh, in an open hardware group. And um, also for the license uh, and the design flow, as uh, uh, Ariane uh, uh, talked about, uh, talk about it uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we have to be uh, independent from uh, any technology. Chisel is one technology uh, which is uh, uh, developed uh, by uh, Berkeley, so um, uh, it's better to be uh, in a more classical uh, design flow. And also for our license, uh, we need to to be able to export um, the, the CPU and to, to, to create our product. So it is all, uh, all those aspects it's important to choose a good uh, CPU. And so we have done um, a kind of uh, a review of all CPU um, uh, in, um, uh, in, in the place. And uh, we have seen that uh, Ariane and also Risky are two uh, good, uh, good uh, microprocessors for all that, the, those things. OK, thanks. Thanks, Madoc. We'll come back to how to, how to choose uh, how to choose a CPU, there's lots out there uh, in, a, in a minute, but that's because that's another question. Um, uh, so Florian, uh, I know you guys have done some work with Shipyard and uh, with Ariane uh, as, as part of the project uh, at ETH. Can you talk a little about that? So, so technically, I have to correct you. This was uh, contributed by the Berkeley guys. Um, oh, I'm I have, sorry. Uh, okay. I have done no nothing of it. and um, uh, But uh, I think it's a, it's a very neat project which shows the interoperability between um, Chis a Chisel environment and, um, and the system Verilog environment, and maybe which can be a good partition for the future, I'm, who am I to, to judge here, uh, is that you, uh, that you have the Chisel, which is really good at generating all this cabling and interconnect with maybe not too much payload in it. Um, and you have a classic system Verilog language um, uh, implementation of, of a processor. So I think this is, is quite an exciting project and it, it, it can show, I mean, it is more kind of a research type but it also shows that there is maybe a place for the two of, of, of the, the, two, uh, the two worlds, so to speak. Right, very good, thanks. Uh, so we're almost at the top of the hour and we want to be respectful of your time. There's still a lot more questions. We'll probably end up with a blog post or something trying to deal with the questions that we haven't answered today. Uh, but I want to get to two more topics. One is the bus architecture. What's this OPI thing, I think was one of the questions. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. 
but another question that we've had come in is like, geez, there's lots of cores out there. And you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but how do I choose? Right? So, uh, one of the aspects of the, um, the with the advent of an open ISA with risk five is that it's great. You know, you know, any one of us can start a, a, a core design, throw it up on GitHub and say, Hey, I've, I've got an open source core. Here it is. Uh, part of the challenge that we have as a community, if we really try are trying to build, uh, open hardware implementations that can be used uh, and adopted, we need to achieve critical mass, right? We need to get enough uh, developers and adopters focused on a handful of cores. The good thing is there's lots. The bad thing is there's lots. Not all of these cores will have critical mass. Uh, so part of the challenge is uh, looking at look at technology that's well implemented, has good PPA metrics, has uh, uh, you know, support in, in commercial tool flows and so on. And that's how actually Open Hardware Group got started around, in particular, the risky uh, development and area and development at EPH. Uh, but Davide, uh, do you want to add anything uh, to that in terms of core selection and so on, benchmarking and? Yes. Um, so this, this code, as a, the, I'm talking more about the CV32E4, uh, whereas the uh, CV uh, A6 is an application cross core and uh, maybe it has less competitors, let's say. Um, the CV32 is a simple in order single issue core that you may find many of those are uh, open source there. But as Rick said, this has uh, a critical mass has been taped out and tested and there are also products based on it, evaluated by many companies. And in addition, it has been um, extended with uh, uh, custom instruction sets that are uh, very efficient, both in terms of uh, energy and performance in the IoT domain. So it's very good for uh, microcontroller systems that have to do heavy computations. If you want to have a competitor uh, uh, CPU in out there, is, it would be the Cortex uh, ARM M3, M4 like. Uh, core. So of this kind of processor, there are not so many out there. The open source ones are usually just a, ris just a ris five, so they haven't been extended. Whereas this one has also um, custom instructions and compiler support. That's why it has also been uh, heavily used out there. Very good, thanks. Well, you have time for just maybe one more and then we'll have to do the rest on, uh, actually we'll do two more the OBI question, and then a time frame for when we think we're done. When is RTL freeze happening? Uh, so first one, uh, Ar Arjan, for you, geez, what's this OBI thing? Why would we do that? And what's the, what's the relation to like AHP or Axie uh, and so on? Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, o OBI, it stands for Open Bus Interface. Uh, it is almost identical to the initial or to the original RISC-E interface. So the, if you look at the pin names, and uh, uh, that, that remained exactly the same. Um, but in our opinion, there were a couple of issues with the original RISC-E interface. Um, one of them was that uh, addresses uh, or address phase information did not remain stable on the instruction interface during weight transfers. And that complicates that actually complicates translation to HB or AXI because these protocols have such a requirement. Secondly, uh, there was no, uh, it was not allowed to have a default grant in the original protocol. So that, that we fixed. And again, the reason is this simplifies, uh, for example, the translation to AXI where default grants are allowed. Uh, and thirdly, uh, in the original implementation, certain combinatorial paths uh, were present, uh, which are forbidden on the equivalent AXI uh, interfaces. Uh, so all the fixes we did uh, were aimed at making it easier to actually translate to uh, HB or AXI and doing that with both higher frequency and lower cycle count. So th those were the considerations. And other than that, we, we, we stayed extremely close to the original. Very good, thank you. 
Okay, we're just about at the time. In fact, we're a minute over, but we'll finish up with one more topic around the uh, where are we with these cores? How how mature is, is the code base now in terms of the verification work? When do we think we'll be done verifying these cores and moving on to different implementations, different versions? Um, Arjan, you want to take that as a as a that, as the chair of the course task group, you want to take that one and then maybe Davide, you can make a comment as well. Yeah, okay. um, let's say the, the status of the core itself, right? Of the RTL that everybody can see for themselves at, uh, at GitHub, right? You can just look at the open issues. Uh, they have all been classified now. Uh, so if you apply the right filters, you will see that there are today, there are 16, uh, one six, non-resolved issues in the RTL itself. So those uh, still need to be resolved. And out of these 16 are, eight are floating point related, seven are uh, pulp extension related, and one is related to the fence uh, instruction. So that, that's how the split is. Uh, new issues will come in as verification progresses and the target uh, completion for the, let's say for the base, excluding uh, FPU uh, and excluding uh, the pulp instructions. So the, uh, the verification target for that is end of September, September 25th. Perfect. Any comments on the Ariane core? Same question. Yeah. Uh, 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 the Ariane core has just crossed the start line at open hardware, so we have started later uh, than uh, risky. Oh, I should not say Arian, I should say CVA6. That's okay, we love those uh, names. Okay, uh, and uh, we are in the process, uh, Thales is in the process of uh, performing a few uh, contribution to Arian, and we would like to gather uh, more participants uh, to uh, uh, increase uh, the size of the verification team uh, at Ariane and there is also another uh, big uh, challenge for us is to uh, uh, improve uh, our, uh, the, the documentation to have an industrial grade doc documentation so uh, we have started I don't know when we will uh, finish that. No, that's a fair comment so uh, you know part of the strategy for the verification is the test bench that we're building, which is all open source uh, stimulus, uh, called the Core 5 Verification Test Bench, is meant to be able to verify um, any RISC V core. And we, in, we expect this to be the most comprehensive and robust verification test bench developed using System Verilog, uh, UVM-based uh, methodologies with step and compare to goal and models, um, uh, and available in the industry. And so the work that we've done on the RISC-E core, uh, it will be directly portable. Obviously, it's a different, it's, the nut is different. It's a different size core. So there's other, other work to be done there and I'm not trying to minimize it, but we'll be leveraging all of that infrastructure that exists on GitHub. You can download the whole test bench right now into your own environment, uh, plug in your own system Verilog simulator and, and away you go. There's make scripts for all of the, uh, all of the popular system Verilog simulators. Uh, so, the, the ramp that we expect to see in, as we focus on Ariane, the, the A6, the CVA6, will leverage all of that work that we've done with the risk core and the CVA E4. We're past the hour uh, and I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I know that there's still a lot more questions. We'll try to maybe package those up. And, uh, this session has been recorded. We will post that uh, online um, for, uh, for uh, playback. And we'll also maybe create a blog post to try to deal with other questions that uh, we did not get to answer today during the episode. But uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your participation. And thank you for everyone for attending. Uh, that's the end of episode two. The third Thursday in August at 11 a.m. Eastern time will be episode three. And that will cover our hardware and software task groups. And in particular, the FPGA bring up environments, the tool chain, there's lots of questions about how do I add custom instructions and get that into a GCC compiler. There's all kinds of different topics to cover there. So third Thursday of August, I think it's the 20th of August. I always get it wrong. Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time, mark your calendar and uh, stay tuned on social media for, for registration for that.
Thank you, everyone. Wherever your day is, I hope you Thank have you. a good one. Bye-bye.